今天很荣幸啊，我们能够就是请到请到这个叫马亚教授到我们这个治疗中心来做这个演讲。对我们这个机会很难得啊，因为这个治疗在这里只待一个月啊。那我们在台大，他在台大哲学系做访问，进行访问啊。那么我看到这个消息就想。就就就来台湾，我们想应该赶快邀请一下，因为我们这里有这个中国这些万能这个中心啊，那我们就一直希望积极，就是与这个国外的汉学家啊、汉学啊、中国哲学的不同领域的人合作啊，然后推推动这个对话、啊、交流啊，所以这个 Jack 在这里也能够扮演很重要的角色，啊、所以我们现在很高兴啊，就有有有他来我们系上做演讲，那么。也许我可以先说说几句来介绍一下这个 Dr. Maya 啊，他是也是德国人啊，啊，他在还是很早就到，就是其实很早就在在在国外发展啊，就是他去去去 l i d e n 啊，主要是在 l i d e n 啊求学，在求学的过程在 l i d e n 去汉学，好像还有博士班，博士班 ，OK， 在 l i d e n 然后呢，其实很早就来台湾，对，就是你刚刚说一九九六到二零零零年。在台湾啊，这个台大求学啊，所以他也就是跟台湾有很深厚的这个源流啊。那接下来他啊，就是二零零，就是写写完这个博士论文啊，到莱顿大大大学嘛，那博士论文了之后，就是申请到这个莱顿二二零零七年啊，申请到这个在这个牛津大学的这个 lecture 的这样一个 position 啊。那么然后从此就在 Oxford 这个自己啊，做研究啊，教书啊。啊，他的主要的研究领域是这个思想史啊，特别是指这个先秦啊，先秦中国思想史啊，而且啊，他所注重的比较是一种可以说的一种，就是他最注重注重的是，有点像上次我们这个这个请到的这个李桂杰教授的一种很细心文本，就是对文本进行很细心的阅读，是 close reading， 是他的可以说他这个方法的一个他的方法论的一个特征啊，而且他非常重视啊，在这个。最近这这几年，在英美汉学的一个很一直受到很注意的一个也很受到注意的一个议题，就是 morality 的问题，就是口述性。啊，那过去的汉学家，啊、不管在中方或者东方或者西方，比较没有那么注意到这样一个议题，他们可能直接把这文字史或者文本、啊，像《上书》啊，《伦理》《孟子》，视为文文本啊，都反反反而比较忽略背后有一个很重大的一个口述的传统。和另外一个一个一个一个脉络啊，我们不能是不能忽略的啊，就是啊，所以这个一个是个 reality 的问题呢，所以这个又跟这个这个 discourse 就是这个论述的一些实质的社会啊，或者或者文物式的条件有关系啊，所以啊，他也当然很早就注意到这个著作文献啊这样的一个，我们都知道这个做中国哲学啊这个领域啊的的人都知道这个著作文献对这个我们对先秦哲学的一些。既定的看法就是，发就是做做的，就是我我们意识到我们要对一些既定的看法要进行修修正啊，所以啊，他也就最近出了他的博士论文，麦亚教授啊，这个 philosophy and bamboo 啊，所以我们看看得出他对这些著作文献有很重要的啊，就是啊的，或者有有这样的研究啊，这样的一个小标题是 text and the production of meaning in early China， 这个传一下给大家看这个书。呃，那他的研究著作也相当多啊，这个文章，像比如说 texts, textual communities and meaning, the genius Loki of the Warring States, Chu Tong, Volume One， 哈哈哈哈哈，这个文章，他也是书店，对，就是他是注意了这个 meaning meaning 的成型过程啊，而而且这个 meaning 如何在这个文本上，在、这个、著作文上显现出来，或者像这个 memory 这样的议题，啊， memory 啊， memory construction 这样的议题，啊，一直。是他所关注的一个议题啊，或者这个呃文本的内在结构，还有一点很重要啊，这个也在国外的汉学一直受到重视，就是 argumentative structure 或者 argumentative strategy 这样的一个议题，就是论证策略啊。我们现在都作为就是就是我们我们像我们学威根斯坦的人都都知道，就是在讨论哲学问题啊，常常也就讨论哲学问题，常常等于某一种风格、就是、style 啊，每一个哲学家有一种风格，每一个思想家有一种风格。他有一个，他在讨论问题的时候，就是隐隐约约的用某一种书写方式、某种风格来讨论这个问题，所以也是这样一个风格，也在某个程度上决定他讨论问题的方式。所以啊，如果我们现在，比如说我们在在在在
在做做英美哲学的时候啊，我们就用一个比较 analytical 的 approach 啊。那我们在台湾现在很多学者也就是像像方老师也是，就是试图用一个比较这样一个 analytical approach 来读一些，重新读一些像庄子那样的古代的文本啊。那个时候就可以讨论出一些很有趣的呃议题来。那那但同时我们也当然也要。他们不注意到，就是那个风格的不同啊，就是庄子这样一个风风格啊，是跟我们现在在这个论文啊、学术论文上所看到的学作写作方式是截然不同啊，就是因为他的文学是一种可以说是文学作品，又是文学作品又是哲学作品，所以像庄子可能是一个好例子，或者我们看孟子或者今天那个也比较专注注意的那个尚书啊，他这个风格、写作风格或者论证策略那个 a r g u m e n t a t i v e strategy 也都非常特别啊，所以这个。啊，第二个今天要谈的演讲的题目是这个顾命啊，就是《尚书》里的一一一章啊，啊，大家特别注意到这一章，然后是 construction of memory in warring states political philosophical debate， 所以他今天就要特别可以说注意到这个文本与这个 memory 啊记忆之间的这个关联啊，所以我们就我也不不要不要说太多啊，不要太多说，我们就直接把时间交给这个。对，蛮有。嗯，谢谢。我们当然有一个小时，你可以很随心所欲的啊，先介绍一下你这个这篇论文啊，然后，然后呃，也许可以到一到一半，先休息一下，看看有没有什么问题，或者说，然后再请你先讲记忆嘛。对，这个 memory， 对，很贵。对对对对。那开始感，开始感谢大家，我嗯，今天可以来这里演讲一下。嗯，那么非常感谢开，那么那么客气的那个介绍。嗯，我跟大家很抱歉，纵然我当时念台大中文系，念了四年，呃，大学部是在台大念的，但是离开了台湾之后，都在讲中文。呃，那纵然你一整天都会读古书，但是讲话的机会很少。所以，现在不好意思，就是，嗯，呃，只能用英文来演讲。我希望大家不会，嗯，呃呃，在意，呃，不会，不会怎么样。那假如有什么不同的东西、地方，呃，当然，呃，可以，呃，随时跟我说，哎，请问一下，这个我不懂。那所以，嗯嗯，开跟我说就是很很很比较轻松一点，所以。纵然我用英文来讲话，但是等一下的的沟呃的的讨论，当然、呃、我中文可以听得懂，只是我没有办法演讲。嗯，希望大家可以嗯抱歉一下。So I'm switching to English now. Um, well, as um, as you see, um, today I'm I'm planning to talk about the Gu Ming, which is uh, one um, chapter in the transmitted. Um, Shangshu in the new text recension of, uh, of the Shangshu. The Gu Ming is in itself already a highly exceptional text. First of all, it is unique in terms of its length in, um, in, 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 in the entire Shangshu material. So it's probably the longest chapter of the entire Shangshu. And the second thing is that um, it is exceptional in terms of having um, quite a high amount of narrative material paired with fairly little um, dialogue. Whereas normally in the Shangshu you would expect actually the opposite to happen, that you'd have, you'd have a dialogue, you would have a, um, a, 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 a discussion between either the king and the ministers or something. The, the, the booming is quite the opposite. So what you have is you have lots of narrative with very little speech. Um, the Gu Ming purports to present or purports to witness, um, that is, the Gu Ming presents itself as though it was witnessing the act of succession from King Cheng to King Kham. And that's a funny term in English. Um, um, and the story goes that King Cheng, facing um, or fearing that his death was imminent, called in his ministers to present them with a request about his succession. After then conducting a ritual washing, um, he gave a speech to the attending men where he stressed the unbroken line of rightful rule from King Wen and King Wu to himself. So what the, what the, oh, and then in the speech,
speech, he, the speech that he gives to his, his first ministers, he demands the same loyalty of his men that he, at the time, showed towards King Wen and King Wu. He demands that they give the same loyalty to his son, Zhao, um, who should then become the future king. So what the Guming does, it pronounces a very strong idea of primogeniture. Um, so that, that, that rule should go... Yes, so that, that the rule is from the father transmitted to the son. It follows, after, after these speeches, a mini description of the rituals of succession procedures that in length, form, and attention to detail is unseen elsewhere in the Shangshu. The text then finally closes with an announcement of the new king, the new king Kang. The paper that I want to present here today um, will be a very detailed close reading of the argumentative bits in the Kuming. And as a second step, I want to contextualize the Kuming with one of the recently received manuscripts from the Warring States period, the Tsinghua uh, manuscripts that have um, um, so that have uh, texts that are very close in, in genre to what we have as the uh, transmitted Changshu. And I then, as a third step, by reading the Guming through the recently received Bao Xun, I want to recontextualize the Guming in intellectual terms in Warring States period discourse. Um, before I start, perhaps it makes sense that I say a methodological word here. Um, because um, the problem in Chinese language, I must say, is that we have one word, Wenben. Uh, um, um, but Wenben, Zhong. one is the manuscript and one is the text. And we must not confuse, and that's highly, uh, highly important, we must not confuse manuscript with text. Text can travel independent of a manuscript and, well, not vice versa, um, that means a text is, can be oral. A text does not need to be written. A text can be remembered. Um, so it's important that we keep the two apart, that we keep them separate. Manuscript on the one hand, Wenbin, and text on the other hand, <laughs> but it's not Wenbin. Um, I, I guess you, you, you get my easy. Shogao is a manuscript. It's a Shogao is a manuscript. Yes, that would Shogal. actually that would Wenbin that would show God. That would work. I mean, uh, I think that would work. The problem is that in the literature, um, um, that is not yet a term that's normally used. So what I see, at least in the text that I read, people write Wenbin. Uh, but that's not quite Chiada, the um, Yongfa. The Guming that we have, the transmitted Guming, is chapter 24 of the new text recension of the Shangshu where it belongs to the division of the Zhou Shu. I'm not sure probably people know about, about the, the, um, how the, how the Shangshu is organized. It represents an idealized picture about the act of succession from King Chen to his son Zhao, the future King Kan. I mentioned that. The Gu Ming is generally considered a genuine text. That's a highly problematic term, and we perhaps want to discuss that later. Um, and what people say when they talk about booming as a genuine text, as a genuine text, but that, 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 that concept, that idea of a genuine text is as problematic in itself, so we must actually, I hope you, you remind me, we talk about this later. Um, and the gooming that we have is generally considered to belong to the earlier layers of Shangshu production. And that means it is together with the five Gao chapters, with the um, Jun Shi chapter and the Pangong chapters, belongs what people normally believe to the earliest level, a layer of, of Shangshu production, early layers of uh, Western Zhou uh, Shangshu. Um, today, the main trend in scholarship is to place the
the date of the production of the booming sometime between the Western Joe period and early spring and autumn period. The text I've mentioned is exceptional for its quantitative amount of narrative material combined uh, um, combined with relatively little speech and the text has received much attention for its detailed and elaborate description of a ritual that is otherwise unseen. Um, as we said, or as I probably said, um, the Guming as a text pretends to witness the act of succession from King Chen to his uh, son King Zhao. Um, and as I said, that is important and hence I re repeat it, the Guming um, presents, uh, pronounces the idea of the notion of a primogeniture, that is um, an idea that at the time of the reported event was not yet firmly in place in the still young dynasty of the Zhou. To evaluate what's actually happening in the Guming um, in intellectual terms, as a first step before I actually come to the opposite conclusion, I want to contextualize the Guming with early Zhou history, because that is what people tend to, to, to locate the texts within. Under King Wen, the Zhou attempted, and I um, uh, say nothing new here, to bring the Pen Valley, uh, River Valley under military control. And shortly after the campaign against the citadel of Chong, King Wen died. His son Fa, later known as King Wu, succeeded him and soon led a major campaign against the Shang. A decisive battle was then fought as at Mu year, bringing much of the Shang domain under nominal control of the Zhou. So far, so good. But not long after the decisive campaign against the Shang, King Wu died. I guess that's what everybody knows. His death then led the very young dynasty into a major crisis. Zhou Gong stepped in for the young King Chen to oversee government on his behalf. Ancient sources make it plain that the legitimacy of that move was not undoubted at the time when it happened. And in reaction to what is perceived as potential coup d'etat, um, King Wu's brothers then led a revolt against Zhou Gong which soon culminated in open war, shaking the very foundations of the Zhou dynasty. It took more than three years to pacify regions. Russian formalist Viktor Shlikovsky argued that every literary production is written against the background of other texts. Here I want to take text in the broadest possible way to include historical events, and hence I, I repeat what I said earlier, a text does not be, need to be written. So, um, taking McKinsey seriously in his idea of what a text means, historical background noise, that is what I here take as text in, 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 in this way. And that is what I, as a first step, want to describe as the gegen text, the counter text against which the booming was probably produced. Through the portrayal of an ideal case of royal succession, the Guming seems to testify to the ultimate challenge of the Yang dynasty to establish lasting structures of rule and stable patterns of royal succession. I take this as the starting assumption of this paper, but I will actually formulate the opposite idea later on. Maybe it's a good time here to stop and say in a few words what I've done so far. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
，然后接个第二个阶阶阶段，就是有人把它把这个部分，这个这个内容写下来，啊，这个手稿，啊，那这，然后呢，你三个部分，第第三个阶段是这个手稿嘛，一个就是定型下来，就是然后变成一个 save up this 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 move that that this past、uh, thing of succession was perhaps an idealized representation to take a moment of threat as actually a founding bit of the job. The moment of threat, yes, when 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 when. when 就是因为他刚刚就是提到这个，就是周周公这个周周代早期的周代的历史的，在他的那个文章里面是三页啊，提到这个周文王哈、啊，当时要统治啊，就是要扩展他的领土啊，然后呃、啊、就是这个周文王就去世了，然后他的儿子啊就是发，周发，后来变成就是我我们都知道这个周周武王哈、啊，周武王哈、啊，他继承他，然后他又继续在打，他要讨商啊，要打商啊，然后。在这个牧野啊，打了一场仗啊，然后这个武王啊，接下来就要把，就是封啊封封了他的一些兄弟们啊，把一些领土封给他的兄弟们啊，然后呃，这个不想，然后过过了过了不久啊，这个武王就去世了啊，所以这个接下来有这个成啊成王啊太小啊，所以年纪还太小，还就是太子还太小，所以需要一个周公。对。来来来来，我在这里呃打断一下。那但是重点就是，嗯，有可能以表达这一些状况，顾名有可能在理想化当时的事情，就是嗯，就是呃，当时陈呃呃呃周周公呃立位，然后有战争。但是为什么现在呃，顾命就是名呃呃形容的那么细的一种传位的的的的样子，呃的方法的理解，就是理想化，就把美化嘛、呃，这个实际的过程美化了，就是、把理想化了。对对对对对对对。好像建立一个一个一个 foundational narrative， 好像是这样说。他要他要理想化什么东西？就重点在哪？传承对，传承之外还有什么？重点是。那个 succession 对不对？对，对，因为嗯，他讲那种、那种、那种、那个、那个，呃呃，顾命很、很、很细的解释那个 succession 的事情。但是为什么他需要讲的那么细？就是因为他是呃，在在战争的背景而讲的，所以他本来一种嗯、呃、moment of threat， 他把它转成一种 foundational。Element of Joe history， 充充满威胁或者暴力的那一个时刻，历史时刻变变成一个，就是可以建设性的，它那个整个周代的合理性的一个建设的一个论述。So the decisive incidents of Joe Gong's interregnum that provoked years of instability, turbulence of, and warfare to the point that the very existence of the Still Young Dynasty was under much threat, left a lasting mark in the cultural memory of the Joe. The Guming it now seems institutionalizes that memory in two ways. First, it creates remembrance, de, of the past in a way in which particular meaning com the community, a particular Yi Shi Quan, wish to keep it, and against the background of turmoil, elevates the succession of King Chen in such a way that it becomes part of the foundational past of the Zhou. The Guming, it would thus seem, seems to manifest the attempt to reconfigure the presence of threat into founding myth of the Zhou. That would be the first hypothesis that we ask against、um, this, 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 this text. As a next step,、um, I go into a more detailed analysis of the composition of the text. The Guming, as I said, is a rather lengthy text that combines speech. With elaborate description of ritual that is otherwise unseen in the Shangshu, I want to divide the text into seven parts as follows. Well, by that, finishing the context. First is the specification of context, which is a frame that specifies the account by defining it in time and space. Second is the king's charge, that is, the king here stresses its rightful place in the Zhou line and makes the plea to his men. That they support his son Zhao. Third, then comes the death of the king,、um, and this unit is again a subframe for the subsequent ritual 
that specifies um, um, the elaborate um, information about how the act of succession actually looked like. Then we have the, king post, the king's post-mortem ritual, where we have a very fine-grained description of the ritual, of, his, of, 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 of how he's been buried, etc. We then have the command of an intonation, and that is already after the new king becomes enthroned as king, um, the grand scribe intonates um, that, that command. Um, finally, the oath, uh, followed by the oath, where the king is confirmed as rightful successor, and the conclusion of the ritual as the last bit of the booming. Together, parts one and two um, form the first larger unit of the text. I take them as subcanto one, as the first uh, coherent bit. And parts three to seven can be subsumed under this description of ritual, and they formulate canto two of the text. So we have two stable elements in the jo uh, in the, in the guming that are stylistically very different, that are content-wise very different, and I want to keep them apart for the purpose of the analysis here. In my analysis, in fact, I will only focus on the first part of the guming. Um, that is um, um, uh, the frame and the king's charge. I take and, and, and these are actually the ones that are formulated in typical shu lei pattern, whereas um, pattern. Um, I take the first two bits as the ko that constitutes the guming. This is the ko text. This is And with ko, I do not want to say that the two parts form the earliest bits of composition, but simply that they mark. The, um, the intellectual foundations of the text. This bit forms a stable pattern of text production, and as I show later on, it became reproducible in other contexts too. Subsequent to part one and two, the dictum of the gooming changes, and the text moves very much from the shoe form to a leaf form. Now, part one. Um, Part one frames the account. Just a, 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 a Part one frames the account by situating the booming in times of concern. The frame is a common device in the limit in, in, uh, to define the limits of time and sometimes of space in a narrative. In the case of the booming, as in many other texts of Shangshu, it does so by making use of the common formula opera uh, formula of a shu genre and bronze inscriptions. The setting is defined in temporal terms together with the event that gives rise to the gooming, and that is the illness of the king, as you see, um, yeah, written against the wall. I take this part on the whole that we see at, at, um, uh, put against the wall as the initial frame of the gooming, and I should like to split it into three further elements. The first element situates the account in time and concern. It mentions the reasons for the account taken and it defines it in temporal terms. No location is given and the king here is portrayed as severely ill. The second is the specification of the event. The mention of the sexagenary cycle here serves to introduce a new event that is, however, closely related to and in fact dependent on the king's illness. The ritual washing of the king's hair and face, which is an important element that, that will concern us later again. This information marks a subcontext within the frame and separates the defiance of the text of the event in form of a linear progression of episodes before the various officials are being summoned. And after then the officials moved in, the third element of the frame gives voice to the king himself. The speech of the king then contains two elements. Um, it's it's uh, uh, 3a and 3b. I hope that's, that's visible. The first part establishes the context of the message to be delivered. Serving as the opening of the speech, I take it to be part of the initial frame. With the speech of the king, the language of the booming changes, and it changes radically. We no longer see the neutral 
documentary style that is reminiscent of the language in bronze inscriptions. Instead, the modus now shifts to a much more personal style, introduced with a the theatrical exclamation, Uhu, the speech of the king presents a dramatic appeal to his ministers. We now move on to the King's Charge itself. The King's Charge manifests a powerful example of early Chinese rhetoric. What in the still young dynasty is in fact very much a novel act of hereditary succession is coated with layers of charged language suggesting tradition, stability, and the succession of power as an act of routine, which I must stress it never was. The core of the speech contains three components and it follows a clear division of past, present, future that we also normally see in, in bronze inscriptions. In the first part, the speech of the king connects to the past by evoking the rule of king Wen and Tu. It situates the position of King Chen within the line of rule and stresses his natural and legitimate place in that line, declaring that he never went against the spirit of King Wen and Wu, and reverently welcomed heaven's fierce and charge. The king, the king skillfully applies the purported historical case to the present situation. By putting it, uh, the present in parallel opposition to the past, the speech demands the same loyalty from the ministers towards himself, uh, towards himself that he is support uh, uh, prepared to have shown towards King Wu at the time, and that King Wu before him has shown to King Wen. That this is not done in explicit terms, but through the presence um, of uh, parallel illusions is seen in 3a, 3b, 3c here. And, and that can be defined as follows. Subsequent to the evoke, sorry that this is very technical, it becomes less technical a bit later on. Subsequent to the evocation of the past to serve the present in order to secure the loyalty for the king, the speech pronounces three separate admonitions. I have marked them in A, B, C. One is on the political level, where King Chen cautions his men with regard to the handling of the states that you see in B. This political charge is framed by two statements that refer to the minister's conduct toward the future king, that is A and C. And the formal arrangement of the charge indicates, through its presence, that these two elements are mutually intertwined. You can't separate them. Okay, this is as much as I want to talk about the Kuming in its first place. I would now move on to the Baoxun, um, which I take to contextualize the booming in intellectual terms, and then I come to rereading of the booming after having um, taken a look at, at the recently found um, um, uh, Baoshun manuscript. The Baoshun can be roughly divided into three parts. Oh, the Baoshun, I must perhaps explain, is a recently received manuscript. It's a part of the Tsinghua collection. Um, unfortunately, the Baoshun the entire Tsinghua collection was not excavated in a supervised excavation, but it was purchased on an antique market in Hong Kong and then returned to Tsinghua Daoxue. Um, it is pretty much accepted that these texts are real. That is, um, they're not fake produ productions by later people who just wanted to give the indication of an earlier tradition. So, despite the fact that we don't have the tomb from where they are, actually, Tsinghua knows where they're from, but they cannot say it. But has the authenticity of these texts verified? They verified by external, external experts? Well, what has been done is that the slips have been tested with a C14. But by Tsinghua scholars? By Tsinghua uh, well, no external that, I'm not, that I'm not sure actually. But the um, C14 method has um, actually, I think they will send it to Shanghai, but I'm not entirely sure about that. The C you mean it's real? It's a real manuscript or it's a real text? Well, uh, um, 
It is a Django time manuscript that carries a Django time text. And that we can be very sure. Very sure means if we trust Chinese paleographers, if we trust their C14 methods. Um, but I, I, had, I was just coming from Hong Kong where we had a conference on the Ting Ho slips and I spoke to people who don't normally believe that stuff um, from the Shanghai group because the Shanghai group and the Tsinghua group are very much doily. And I spoke, I had a long conversation with Chen Jian, who is perhaps the most recognized choreographer at the time, and he said, Mighty, punish your gender. Um, so I take this as their gender. Um, they are not fake artifacts, they are jungle time materials. But everything that, has, uh, that is said has to be taken with some portion because in the end um, we all remember the Hitler diaries um, um, where everybody was sure as well. Okay, that's, that's, that's to the texts. So the Baoshin, the Hitler diaries, people know, right? Um um, 叫代或者叫水。那个叫水。叫水。后来发生大理头一些化学里面的东西，当时三十年代还没有存在。后来就是牛津买大的历史学家就不怎么喜欢，嗯，但是就是事实。所以这个是有可能性的，but so, it's 比较小可能性。So we have a frame, uh, like in the Guming, uh, we have a frame. Um, and that frame situates the uh, Baoshun just as in the Guming in time of concern. Next, and under two, comes the primary speech of the king that narrates them on two parallel cases. And third, we have the closing of the admonition. Speech in the Baoshun is very much framed in much the same way as we have in the Guming. The difference in, is that in the Guming, the king calls in his... That's actually the opening frame of the, of the Baoshun, sorry, and I want to talk about this. Um, well, we can talk about the frame. Speech in the Baoshun is framed in much the same way as in the Guming. The difference is that in the Guming, the king calls in his ministers, while in the Baoshun, he addresses his son. And while the king in the Guming, that is King Cheng, instructs his ministers because he fears that he will not last long enough to give a formal declaration about his succession to pass on rule to his son, that is the Ba Xun, in the Ba Xun, the king, that is King Wen, fears to lose the treasured instructions, what they call Ba Xun, and therefore he advances to present the charge in written form. In both cases, the king describes his suffering in dramatic terms before moving on to the charge that is then the core cool part of the speech. So we've seen here um, in the frame the Baoshun follows the exact structural patterns of the Gumi. Even some key elements of the Papula remain intact. As the Gumi, the opening of the king's speech is framed by three elements. All three elements correspond in the identical terms to those of the Guming. I've marked the differences in red. This can be described in the as follows. First comes the initial frame that situates the whole temp uh, uh, event in temporal but not in spatial terms. As in the Guming, this element also specifies the concern of the Baoshun, that is, the king is in imminent danger of dying, and so the um, uh, uh, treasured instructions, the Baoshun, might be lost. The illness, just as in the Guming, is put in the exact same euphemistic terms. The central image of the ritual washing appears next. As in the Guming, it is headed by a specification of the day, the sexagonary cycle. Then, there is a gap in the Baoshun because a slip is missing. Presumably, however, some 12 or 13 characters should be 
put in here, before then the third element continues with the opening of the speech, which then forms what I've marked with the 3B element of the initial frame of Kumi. Now, given the structural coherence of the two texts, we can assume with some confidence a similar contextualization to appear at the point where the Baoshun is incomplete, had it not been incomplete. Last comes the opening of the speech. And as in the Guming, the increasingly severe situation of the king's illness is being stressed here. It calls for immediate action on the part of the king to give instructions about his succession. Hence, the existence of the text. Now, I promise I will be a bit less technical. Um, the Tinghua Baoxun and the new text recension of the Gu Ming present two different stories. The analysis, however, shows that key elements of the popular correspond closely in the two texts, that both texts frame their stories in an identical manner. The text presents a structurally uniform case and it seems that structure allows for different contents to be put in much the same mold, with the result that different contextual elements become mutually interchangeable. In one case, there's King Chen, in the other case, there's King Wen. While King Chen addresses his ministers, King Wen addresses his son, possibly in written form through the presence of his child. In both cases, there was the felt need to explain or to legitimize the existence of the text, again, much in the same terms. While the Gu Ming explains the presence of an oral charge, the Bao Xun justifies his written existence. Then comes the king's charge in the Bao Xun. When it comes to the charge, the similarity between the two texts break off. While the Gu Ming presents a charge to his ministers, that's put much in the dictum of gravity, the Baoshun gives an admonition by falling into a narrative where the repeated use of anecdotes entertain ideas of continu continuity with the past. The two anecdotes in the Baoshun, which unfortunately are a bit small when you see them at the wall, I'm sort of on page... It's a long, yeah. uh, my, my version has no page numbers. Um, the anecdotes in the Baoxun work in parallel mode towards each other. On the one hand, there is Yu Shun, the legendary ruler and personification of filial piety and rightness, who, on the basis of his virtues, receives all under heaven from Yao. The anecdote enjoys a high presence in the literature from the Warring States period and appears in text of much different type, where Shun is represented as the archetype of a commoner appointed because of his merit in Warring States period thinking. As a kind of parallel opposition, the case of Wei is cited next. Wei, or Shangjia Wei, was a founding ancestor of the Shang royal lineage. The term Zhong here is of primary importance in both anecdotes. Shun obtained it and ruled the world accordingly, while Wei borrowed it and took revenge on Yao Yi for his death of his father. No matter, however, what Zhong means in precise terms, it here indicates power, perhaps even legitimacy, over a political entity. It allows Shun to rule over all under heaven and it enables Shang Jia Wei to take revenge on Yao Yi. How now? Does this all relate to the Gu Ming? First of all, working on the assumption that the Tinghua manuscripts are not forged artifacts but real, the Baoxun has a clear ante quem, and that is, it was produced at the latest 300 BC, when the manuscript was being produced and put away. But the Baoxun is not just a material representation of a manuscript from the Warring States period. Moreover, it is fundamentally, and I mentioned that, a Warring States period text. As far as we can tell, Yao and Shun, as a pair, did not feature prominently as examples of moral conduct much before the Warring States period. And Yin and Yang, as a pair, also did not gain prominence before then. 
Moreover, the two anecdotes used in the Baoshin clearly underpin the socio-political concern to argue against rule by hereditary right and promote meritocracy as a model instead. In neither of the two pseudo-historical cases used in the text was rule obtained through the right of birth. Shun was given all under heaven by Yao, and Chen Tang took it by force from Jie. Jie, so the story goes, by Eastern, uh, or, or that was at least the take of Eastern Zhou thinkers, had lost the mandate and hence the right to rule. Looking back at both the opening of the text and the closing of the admonition, the same also applies to Fa, the future King Wu, who ended Shang rule. King Wu did not inherit all under heaven. He took it by force because the, La, the Shang had lost the mandate. The themes of mandate, abdication, and rule by merit were of a pivotal concern during the Warring States period and triggered glaring debates at the time. In intellectual terms, the Baoshun is right there in the debate. When seen in this light, the text appears to argue precisely against the position articulated in the Gumin, where hereditary rule was celebrated as the ultimate source of stability. At the same time, it looks as though the Baoshun did not argue against what was being presented in the Gumin in generic terms, but it also takes direct reference to that particular text. To begin with, the Baoshun purports to be of the same type of text as the Guming, in that it assumes the literary form of a Shu. Second, the Baoshun is located close to the Guming in chronological terms, while Guming presents itself as a witness to the succession of rule from King Cheng to his son, the Baoshun positions itself one generation before that event by giving witness to the succession of rule from King Wen to King Wu. So the Baoshun tries to look like being one generation before the Kuming, in other words. Third, and most importantly, the Baoshun appropriates the exact frame as used in the Kuming and so, rather explicitly, it seems, relates the one text to the other. The reduplication even goes so far that individual elements of the popula of the one text are being repeated in the frame of the other. Especially striking here is the element of the ritual washing of the hair and the face that is repeated near the better. Except for the Baoshun, this word of the ritual washing has no single presence outside the Guming in the literature of the entire early literature. It does not appear in the bronze inscriptions and it is absolutely absent from the text from the Warring States period. The intertextual correspondence between the two texts is not by coincidence. Instead, it confirms the relatedness of the two texts. And while the presence of the term of the washing of the face or the, the absence sorry, of that term outside the two texts is at least surprising, the overall picture that the Kuming presents us in the world of thought of the Warring States period is actually alarming. Think of the type of text that we have in the Kuming. The Kuming is considered a genuine chapter of the Shangshu. It takes a vital part of the foundational parts of the Zhou as the central theme of the text and translates the post jogong period of turmoil into a founding myth of the Zhou. A text of this kind, one would think, should have a remarkable presence in the literature. However, the opposite is the case. Citations of Shu in Warring States literature amount to roughly 300. But literally, no single text of the Warring States period refers to the Gumi. And that situation only changes during the Han when Zhen Xuan elaborates on lines from the Zhou Li with reference to the Gumi and when texts such as the Shi Ji, the Han Shu, or the Bai Hu Tong start to draw on lines from the Guming to elaborate on their own positions. One starts to wonder, therefore, whether the Guming is really what it presents itself to be, or, one should perhaps better say, what tradition makes us believe it is. In fact, when reading the Guming with the Bao in mind, things seem to fall into place much more gently. Perhaps the Guming should not be read as an attempt to translate 
the post-Joe Gong period of, fonday, um, of turmoil into a foundation myth of the Joe produced for a Western Joe or Spring and Autumn audience, uh, audience. Perhaps we should turn the whole thing around and read it instead as an attempt to appropriate Western Joe foundational myth to make a rather strong claim for rule by hereditary right. To read it against the background of the Baoxun would thus mean to place the Guming into the Eastern Zhou in intellectual terms. When a discourse about ideal forms of government took form, and when positions such as hereditary rule versus appointment through merit were debated with much passion. This would imply that the Baoxun did not uh, uh, that the Baoxun should not be read as a countertext to the Guming in terms of a chronological progression, but that we should consider the possibility that the Guming was the product of the same intellectual debate where it formulated a voice much in opposition to what was being put forward in the Baoxun. With this, I do not wish to say that the Guming in its entirety was an Eastern Zhou publication. Different elements of the text may well be of a much older date. But the composition, and that is another thing that is important, the composition, the creation of the Guming as a text, and its clear political philosophical stance on rule by right of birth, looks very much like an Eastern Zhou formulation. And I should say a late Eastern Zhou formulation, actually. Taking the Guming as a text from Eastern Zhou might also be a good reading strategy for contextualizing the long, elaborate, and in-depth description of the ritual in the Guming, which I haven't touched upon here. As an Eastern Zhou take on the cultural accomplishment of the Western Zhou, the Guming presents a systematization and hence fixation of that image. The celebration of ritual is an important element in this. As an idealized image of the past, it provides the framework for legitimacy of the present claims. Seen from this perspective, the manifestation of speech and ritual in the Guming might less be a case of a genuinely performative act of institutions of political commemoration of the Western Zhou, as Martin Kern suggested previously, but perhaps the expression of a retrospect idealization of such an event for political um, uh, ends. This way, a shared narrative of origin and identity is appropriated for the political philosophical objects of one particular meaning community, and that it claims a direct connectedness to their ideas with most ancient origins. In this sense, the Guming portrays a highly specific ritual that claims historical reality and hence validity in its application to the present. This is a rather strong case for calling on for loyalty to past rulers and their actions, which can only be achieved by reduplicating the pattern of succession in the present. It does not matter which of the two texts came matter which of the two texts came first, the Baoxun or the Guming. In fact, it is not even necessary to assume that either of the two manifestations that we now have was produced in direct response to the other for we know virtually nothing about the potentially other instantiation of the fabula that might have been worked into yet another story. Future text finds might find, uh, cast light on shared elements between intellectually related texts that may have been used by a wider community as traveling concepts in support of the formulation of a new argument. As Martin Kern and also David Scarborough remind us, the speeches in the Shangshu and also in the Zhuatran we're not talking facts. And the same is certainly true for the narrative elements that contextualize them. As such, it is possible that such elements became modules to be used in different contexts. This does not mean, of course, that the texts that contain these elements do not contain any historical knowledge, but that such elements were used to, to construct an idealized memory of a common past to provide guidance for the present. Okay, we have come a full circle now. First, a close reading of the full chapter of the Guming brought me to the Baoxun, and from there back to the Guming. The Guming was used in support of the contextualization of the Baoxun in intellectual terms, while a close reading of the Baoxun 
also a methodological necessity to reconceptualize the founding work in the booming as one voice in the socio-political debate of the Boring States period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. How shall we proceed now? We have about one more hour and we should begin with a series of questions. I suppose there are probably there are a lot of questions and we can... Yeah, I found it a fascinating argument, but the argument to ask here is quite complicated, complex. So, I shall I, yeah, shall we open the floor first for questions, for clarifications maybe, and then either in Chinese or in English, and then we go on to debate, uh, the, the debate about the, yeah, the deeper meanings of your argument. Yeah. I think this uh, paper is very technical it is in, term, in terms of technology. Mm. And both, uh, although it is related to philosophy, but if, if we uh, do not have uh, enough training in theology, then it's quite difficult to that's right. I, that's right, that's right, that's right. I, I did warn Kai that it wouldn't be a philosophical paper, but a philological paper. And so it's my, my, um, my fault. And, 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 yeah. and I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that um, it was a bit of a technical thing, um, but I thought so, I'd so give it a try. Maybe, can I ask you a question for clarification? Because you have this very, uh, because we probably don't, all, um, we all don't know either the Gumi or the Baoshu. So your whole case was, was quite, you presented your case quite quickly. So maybe you could say a few more words about the, two arguments because you give us different perspectives of how to read these two texts and but it's, at least in the beginning you claim that the Kuming should be read or has been read as an as argument for hereditary rule and then you use the Baoshin and, and the opposite is, is a, somehow makes a case for marriage of traffic rule yes so well, and what I haven't really understood or what I'm still struggling with is how exactly do you find these this, these two arguments in the texts, for example, you mentioned these two anecdotes about Yao Shun, in the, in, which we find in the Bao Shun, which seem to make a case for meritocratic rule. rule. Yeah. But how exactly, where exactly do they come up, and what's their, the whole their role, the whole argument? Maybe you could say a few more words on, on the, well, the I, argument. I, 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 I repeat the narrative very yeah. briefly. So my first, I mean, the first assumption that uh, the, the, the traditionally and, and, and to, this, to this day, the Kuming is always said to be a Western Joe, or at the latest, an early spring and autumn text. It's always one of the core texts of the Shanshu. It's, 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 it's the, the thing. And actually, there's one voice that says differently, but nobody listens to that, and that's my hero, Gu Um He was the only one who, who presented a voice against that position and said, actually, the booming is an Eastern Joe period. But neither in the West. So this is about the date. That's about the day. But neither, but neither in the West, no much actually, no in China, is really Gu Jiegang's position there um, considered, and people continue to read it as, in, as a Western global publication. Yeah, but yeah, so the, date, the date, the difference between Bozo and Shizu, would that affect your argument? It would very much so, yes. Um, then, I said, okay, we try to read the Kuming in that way and see what actually the text does. The text presents us a very elaborate description of a ritual, an elaborate description of a ritual that is otherwise unseen. A, um, and, and that makes, gives the, the, the Kuming a very um, a special presence in actually everything that we have from preaching in China. Um, the question then is, how does the booming in its presentation of its unbelievably idealized or, 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 or um, a careful presentation of how the, 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 the perfect act of succession looks like, if we then look at this where the booming stands in, its, in historical terms, then you think, okay, what the text does is that 
um, it presents an idealized act of succession against the background of turmoil. Because two generations before the event that is described in the, in the Guming, um, the Zhou was on their knees and, and was nearly done. Um, and so what we have then in the Guming is a text that presents the act of hereditary succession as if never ever happened something else. There's no mention of Zhou Gong taking over and stuff. There's no mention of, of war and turmoil. There is just this, 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 this long tradition of, 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 of hereditary rule. Well, that is at least interesting. Um, then I proceeded and gave a very close description of actually how the Baoxun, uh, the Guming presents its case. And I went into a fine brained analysis of its textual structures. And there, is, there my first bit of the paper stops. As a second bit of the paper, I took the Baoxun. And the Baoxun I took because I'm currently reading all the excavated manuscripts, and I said, oh dear, this is exactly the same thing, but it says the opposite. But I don't say it's exactly the same thing because it just says a King Wen or King Wu and hereditary or non-hereditary, but it assumes the very same literary patterns of the Gumi. So the Baoxun um, takes the same play, a frame, it uses the same technical terms, um, and it, it, it basically acquires the exact same structure with which the Guming presents an argument and uses this structure as kind of a mold and puts different content into this mold. So we have the Guming mold and put Baoxun Neidong in um, That is the, the next thing that I've seen, that, that there's a, a, more than a surprising intertextual relatedness between these two texts. The text, at least when we still assume that the Guming is the older one, which people still do, um, we must at least think that the Guming, uh, the the, the presents itself sort of as, as a counter-argument against that. Um, the Baoxun, this is a clear-cut case, is Zhangguo. But the Neirong is Zhangguo, the Waizai is Zhangguo, the Tajiu is Zhangguo. What, what it argues in terms of, of its Yao Shun case, what it argues against everything that the Baoxun puts forward is very much Zhangguo thinking. There is, there, there, is no, there is no problem whatsoever about this. I mean, there's no one who would claim the opposite if there is in the right mind. Um, that opens up a very different window now. Because, on the one hand, we have a text that is completely out of place because it presents this, this, this strong case of hereditary rule. But there's no gegen text to that. There's no need that the text comes up with such a strong claim for why hereditary rule is so important. Unless you then see, how about I turn the whole thing around and read it against the Baoxun? And read it against a debate that was on in Zhang Wok period. A debate that was all about should we have hereditary rule? But can, can, I, can I make a point here? I'll ask you a question. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned these two anecdotes in the Baoxun, mm -hmm. which are, seem to be about make a case for meritocratic rule uh, against hereditary rule here. So, 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 but it, still, it seems to duplicate to, to duplicate the whole story, the whole narrative about 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 this, 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 this here. The, the, the king, the, 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 the thickness of the king went went when, one and then Chen and then his death. No? So there are two layers at least. Well, so it's this narrative which seems to be exactly it's the same narrative as the Gu Ming. And then you have these two anecdotes. Why, how exactly, why do you claim that these two anecdotes have, are crucial to the whole text? Or why, what is the, the importance of these two anecdotes? Well, the anecdotes present cases of meritocratic rule. Yeah. Um, so the, the Baoxun in its formulation.